da, da, da. The primary question that's been asked about transgenderism as a challenge to the political status quo is the question of how can we be a tolerant society, with the question of who we is being quite a bit different in a Christian society, in a Muslim society, and in the predominantly secular, atheist, liberal and libertine societies that exist here and there around the world. That question, however, is a little bit too easy and maybe misleading in some of its answers, especially when we turn to the much tougher issues of gender reassignment surgery and hormone replacement therapy. I think we have a problem right now in the year 2020, and I think this is a problem that's going to solve itself, of basically treating transgender people with uh, the soft bigotry of low expectations. I did not coin that phrase. Um, when we look at the discourse, scientific as well as political, surrounding women's breast augmentation, so heterosexual, biological women, women born as women, who choose to have breast implants. You'll find right now in the year 2020, there's both skepticism and real concern about disease and disability caused by breast implants. Some of those illnesses are still matters of scientific speculation, but some are not. When women with breast implants complain that they have trouble breathing, that they have trouble sleeping, that they have trouble using their shoulder joint and arm with the full range of motion that they had before the surgery. Those are scientifically completely self-explanatory problems. And they've been studied, I note, by the US military because the US military now has enough women in service that some of those women have gotten breast augmentation surgery while they were in the US military. And then some of those women can't do the same tasks they used to do before they had the surgery. So you can imagine this is like the ultimate research project for kinesiology. How does this actually impair women's ability to, I don't know, lift heavy objects, uh, perform certain kinds of routine tasks in the army routinely? If when a woman a heterosexual, biologically normal woman, uh, born as a woman, if, if we're going to start issuing really stern warnings to women about the risks they're taking, the possible lifetime of disease and disability they're signing up for when they choose to get breast augmentation, why is it that these questions are not being asked, these warnings are not being made as soon as breast augmentation is attached to the political aspirations of transgenderism. Now I say again, I am genuinely, sincerely interested in pursuing a society in which transgender people are tolerated. And because I have the experience of living in Thailand and Laos, two of the most trans-positive societies on earth, I believe they are the two most trans-positive societies on earth, very brief digression, you know, when I was there, um, males who dressed as females, were allowed to enroll in university as females and live in female quarters. Uh, all kinds of government paperwork, uh, official positions in life, you were allowed to declare your gender and live as that gender and so on. And just in daily life, um, everywhere and at all ages, you saw transgender people uh, living among the elderly and among teenagers and among middle-aged people in normal jobs, participating in society. And in the most recent elections in Thailand, there were quite a few transgender candidates and it has to be said they were not treated in a sort of freak show manner. I mean, the society there didn't freak out like, oh, can you believe there's a, there's a man dressed as a woman running for... No, it was normal. It was recognized, okay, this is a transgender male to female person running for election there and then their political views were interrogated to that extent like any other candidate. So the normalization of transgender people, the tolerance of transgender people, and then progressing towards a society where they're meaningful, equal participants in that society, that's something I'm, I'm genuinely interested in. However, I don't think that should come at the price of dismissing the real health impacts of breast implant surgery. 
And as you know, this is not the only surgery. Now, I only mentioned so far the, the mechanical aspects of how breast augmentation impacts women's health. Obviously, just the fact that breast augmentation can ruin your quality of sleep. Again, keep in mind, whether you are sleeping on your back or sleeping on your side, having plastic bags full of silicone inserted under your skin, sometimes under a layer of muscle too, in your chest, it's gonna impair your breathing, it's gonna impair how you feel when you're lying down to sleep. It's very obvious that this could deteriorate your quality of sleep and many women who have the surgery complain of it and many women say that's one of the reasons for having the, the fake breasts removed. The deterioration of your quality of sleep can lead to the deterioration of your emotional condition, your intellectual condition in every way. I mean, I have to say for myself, I'm still sick right now. I've been sick and injured for almost 30 days solid now. Since December 17th, I've been sick. And the main impact on my mental acuity and emotional state is not the illness itself. It's the lack of sleep that comes as a consequence of the illness. So that already is really much more serious than people want to pretend it is. Impaired breathing, again, has these knock-on effects. But most of what has gotten newspaper headlines lately is what's called breast implant illness, where you're talking about an immune system reaction to the presence of the breast implants that then can lead to joint pain and an amazing array of uh, seemingly um, uh, illnesses seemingly lacking any etiology. Uh, but it seems that, and again, there's some scientific speculation here, it seems that these things are a result of the immune system attacking the breast implants and then confusion with the immune system leading to attacking your joints, so on and so forth. So if you have a sexual identity, if you have a political movement that is premised on um, denying the, the very real medical disadvantages of surgical intervention, then you, you have a, a political movement that is bad for the health of its own adherents. And you have a very strange widening gulf between the sort of get tough attitude of medical doctors when they're talking to heterosexual women about this procedure, breast augmentation, and when they're talking to men who are wanting to become male to female transgender people in transition. Now, under the heterosexual women category, I just note, you may be imagining someone who is just out of vanity getting breast augmentation. Medical doctors today in 2020 have to have very, very tough conversations with women who have lost their breasts to breast cancer, who may have scars on their chest from breast cancer, and they may have very tough conversations with women who've had car accidents. You know, there are so many car accidents that yes, it's common enough to have an injury to your chest in a car accident, where women may be wanting breast augmentation uh, just to try to recover a sense of normalcy after an accident like that has, you know, scarified or damaged their, their chest, their appearance in that way. And you can imagine how difficult it would be to be a doctor to say, look, here are the advantages and disadvantages with breast augmentation. Here are the short-term and long-term concerns for how this can destroy your health and really destroy your quality of life. And then to say, look, even if really it would make you feel better about yourself, if it would alleviate some dysphoria you have about your appearance, because a woman who survived breast cancer and so on, that dysphoria may be very real, may be very intense. Maybe the best thing for you to do is to refuse, nevertheless, to have this breast augmentation procedure. Now, when you turn to hormones, we live in a very peculiar era when government guidelines are in flux on the issue of hormones. Um, <coughs> I travel all around the world, partly because of my divorce. Uh, when I go to visit my daughter, I go to various countries in Europe. Some countries I pass through allow the private sector to advertise testosterone as if it were hair dye, as if they were just saying to middle-aged men, hey, you have some gray hairs? Try out hair dye. Make you feel young again. Make you feel better with yourself. There are some countries where testosterone and hormone supplementation of this kind in a completely for-profit way is being advertised. And of course, the side effects, the risk for your health are minimized or dismissed. There are other countries 
where obviously this is illegal or being regulated. And um, within just the last few years, as you probably know, there have been very sudden shifts in how a technology like vaping, um, which is to say the ingestion of nicotine through vapor, how that is and isn't allowed to be advertised and promoted and how it is and isn't allowed to be done. So I think right now in the year 2020, we maybe have not yet come to the point where the controversy over the use of hormones, including on a mass scale, men using testosterone booster unnecessarily, um, where we haven't yet come to a state of alarm and debate about it in the way that people are now alarmed about and debating silicone implants, breast augmentation surgery. But that day is inevitably going to come. I've seen just two transgender YouTubers speak openly about the really negative impacts that hormone replacement therapy had in their lives. And I just want to clarify, these are not ex-transgender people. They aren't people who detransitioned. These are transgender people who transitioned both surgically and through hormone replacement therapy and who have continued uh, their transition. They're, so they're overall happy with their transition, but nevertheless, they came on YouTube and made videos really warning that this completely destroyed their sex drive and had absolutely horrible effects on their mood. Now, likewise, with heterosexual men, um, men who are born as men, biological men, using testosterone booster, in the short term, the dangers and disadvantages of this may not be obvious. But you put yourself in a situation where long term, you can never know, you can never be confident with your own testosterone levels. You may never be able to return to relying on your body's own production of testosterone. And you can have a series of nagging, minor, but nevertheless soul destroying health problems that then haunt you till the day you die because you destroyed your body's ability to produce and control natural levels of hormones. This is not a minor or trivial thing. Now, the outward physical effect of the use of hormone booster, hormone supplementation, is obvious to everyone. It was especially obvious to me when I went to a gym in China. This is when I was living in Kunming, China. I was bench pressing over 200 pounds, so I think sometimes 200 pounds, sometimes 250 pounds. It's not, it's not a lot of weight, guys. It's really not. But I was surrounded by Chinese guys who really had a sort of movie star build, who had much more, much more puffy muscles than I did. And some of them were bench pressing 25% of the weight I was bench pressing. It's like I'm, I'm bench pressing over 200 pounds. They're bench pressing a little more than 50 pounds, you know? I, I just couldn't believe it. They were lifting so little weight and getting these results. And of course, the, the, of course they could be on various performance enhancing drugs, but the most likely suspect is testosterone boosters, testosterone supplementation. Now, this is the desired effect that men are lining up and paying for. But the other effects, the effect on ego, mood, behavior, your sense of happiness or unhappiness, your sense of frustration, your sense of anger. These things are really scary. They're really terrifying to deal with. That in some sense, you're not just tampering with your appearance, you are tampering with your very soul. I, I don't say that as an exaggeration. I've had some female friends, uh, none of these women were really my girlfriends or wives, but I've had some female friends who really suffered extreme mood changes when their period came around, so, you know, once a month. And, you know, I really was aware of it. There were women I spent time with, and it seemed like their whole character changed, their whole emotional character, and their whole intellectual character changed for those few days when they suffered through that hormonal state. Well, what you're doing to your body when you take exogenous hormones, either as performance-enhancing drugs or in order to affect a gender transition, is you're throwing your body into a hormonal crisis that it is in no way evolved to cope with. As difficult as it may be for women, for some women at least, to cope with the monthly hormonal cycle with menstruation, and as difficult as it may be for some women to cope with menopause. 
Those are hormonal states. We have millions of years of evolution uh, rehearsing. <laughs> we have practice on an evolutionary scale coping with those. They're within the normal range of states that we can, we can cope with. Um, as a man, if you tinker with that, whether for the purposes of making yourself look more masculine, shall we say, or for the purposes of making yourself look more feminine, you're rolling the dice in a way, you're taking a risk where, again, apart from the you know simple medically documented um, illnesses that may be brought about, when, when you lose your temper as a man, when you lose control, would you want to live with the nagging doubt that maybe you did that, maybe you acted that way, maybe you felt that way because of the steroids you're on, because of the testosterone boost you're on, because of the, the drugs you're using? And when you tamper with your hormone levels, this is a mood-altering drug that doesn't just affect you for a few hours of the day. It's not, it's not like taking cocaine, for example. Um, this is something that is going to affect the way you see and feel 24 hours a day, every day. In the case of transgender people who use these hormones for a long, long time, they may be planning on doing it for the rest of their lives. So given that there is a real sense of seriousness with which we advise our own sons, um, you may be advising your brother or uncle or grandfather to be really, really careful about messing with their hormone levels, even if this can offer you um, the body of your dreams, let's say, a sudden increase in muscle mass and what have you. And there's no doubt, by the way, I mean, the science backs that up also. Taking testosterone booster as a man can dramatically alter your physique with very minimal effort at the gym. Uh, or if you have a son who wants to transition in gender, shouldn't there be some really sincere discussion here of the disadvantages? And as I say, just now, just in the last couple months, I've heard a couple of transgender YouTubers coming out and speaking about the fact that, hey, from their experience, um, in one case, she said that it was the complete end of her sex drive, that she felt no sexual desire at all, um, that this was like, a, in her words, she called it, quote, a chemical castration, close quote. So th this is a really dramatic, really serious change in your character, in your behavior, in how you feel, in how you perceive the world. And just like the bodybuilder, you're taking on that risk, you know, to change your appearance. And again, my interest with transgenderism politically is just how to have a society that tolerates these people and that works well. And having lived in Thailand and Laos, I already know it's pretty easy to have a society that in this way can be tolerant and, and work well. We can all get along. Uh, I would say this, transgender people do not present a challenge to society, even to the same extent that religious people do, in as much as many religious people, for example, want to have arranged marriage. Arranged marriage is actually a very deep and difficult to handle challenge to our social norms. Should you allow parents to choose who their, their children get married to at any age? Um, this is not, that's probably not something we can tolerate as a society. Probably, you know, we need to intervene and say, no, 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 children have to choose their own partners. By the way, that was a huge political struggle in communist China. China also had a, a tradition of arranged marriage and the government had to intervene and say, no, children have to choose who they're gonna marry themselves. Um, and it's still, it's still a struggle in Chinese culture, less today than it was 50 years ago, obviously. Uh, so, I mean, the, the challenge of accepting and tolerating and including transgender people, I think that's relatively easy, all right? But in as much as the transgender movement attaches itself dogmatically to the defense of and the advancement of hormone replacement therapy at all costs, or breast augmentation surgery at all costs, or other potentially or actually debilitating uh, surgeries, treatments, and what have you at all costs, then they, they put themselves in a position where they're going to need to examine and answer very, very difficult questions, very high level of scrutiny, um, you know, in terms of the consequences for their own members, their own adherents, for their health, for their ability to really lead, lead positive and thriving lives. Now, with all this having been said, let's close with a brief statement about the demon that justifies all of these things, that brings about a halt to all further rational inquiry or debate. And that is the demon of dysphoria. 
What many transgender activists will tell you, um, at least in casual discussions, is that any suffering is justified, whether it's the suffering of literally cutting your penis off, or it's the suffering of, uh, in the case of female to male, um, various hormonal treatments, uh, surgeries that cut the breasts off, so on and so forth, that the suffering of various forms of body modification, hormone replacement therapy, and so on, that all of this is justified because the experience of dysphoria is so terrible, is so challenging for them. It's really worthwhile to look up the etymology of the word dysphoria, and you'll find that the word really has no meaning more specific than misery. People do experience misery with their own bodies. They really do. But I'd like you to imagine for a moment the position of a medical doctor who's approached by an 18-year-old girl, 18-year-old young woman, biological woman, born as a woman, an 18-year-old who comes in and says she's unhappy with her body and she wants the doctor to give her breast implant surgery right now in the year 2020. You can imagine there is a kind of moral onus on the doctor to say to this one woman, young woman, look, you're 18 years old now. Maybe right now you feel this is your top priority in life, but here are the risks, here are the disadvantages, here are the long-term consequences this can bring about in your life. And you know what the other thing is? When you're 28 years old, you might not care about this as much as you do right now. You might think right now that at age 18, having the surgery that's gonna change your appearance, it's really gonna mean so much to you positively. But you know what, as you get older and more mature and gain another perspective, you might, you might regret it later just for that reason. Because you might look back on your 18 year old self and feel that this was an immature decision apart from the very real disadvantages to your health that I've just mentioned. You might also say to this 18 year old girl, you know, you might want to join the army one day. You might want to play a sport one day that, you know, having breast augmentation surgery will really put you at a disadvantage for, you know, significantly apart from all the other problems we've, we've just mentioned. I think there really would be a kind of moral onus on the doctor to talk this through. And this is just talking about a heterosexual young woman who wants breast, breast augmentation for that reason. How much greater is the onus on a doctor to talk to an 18 year old young man who says he wants exactly the same surgery so that he can transition from being perceived in public as a man to being perceived in public as a woman. The disadvantages are tremendous. A doctor who today in the year 2020 has an 18 year old boy come in, 18 year old young man, heterosexual, born biological male, and he says to the doctor that he's unhappy with his body. He says to the doctor that he feels dysphoria when he looks in the mirror because he's skinny and he has no muscles and he's tried so hard to gain muscles at the gym, he's made all these efforts, he wants the doctor to prescribe him testosterone booster. Okay, There must be thousands of doctors every month who have this kind of situation. And you know what? The skinny 18-year-old guy and the flat-chested 18-year-old girl, they probably could go to a psychiatrist or psychotherapist who would write a formal letter to the surgeon saying, officially, this teenager experiences dysphoria. This girl, when she sees herself in the mirror and she's flat-chested, feels dysphoria. This 18-year-old guy, he's really attached to the notion that he ought to have more muscles, better physical development, and he really experiences dysphoria. And you know what? We could add a sympathetic note to either example Maybe both of these kids, the flat-chested girl and the guy with poor muscles, let's say both of them survived a car accident that really made it very difficult for them to develop physically. They have some kind of injury or illness that made their struggle to be physically normal or physically attractive all the more psychologically burdensome. The world is full of examples like that. Dysphoria is not unique to the transgender experience. And I think it's very difficult to trace out what it would or would not justify. Now, this particular 18-year-old girl who comes to the doctor and says this, you know, there are alternatives. There are alternatives to getting breast implantation surgery. And one of the alternatives is also simply to wear a padded bra. 
you know. And there may be ways in which that's somewhat humiliating or challenging or inconvenient or you don't know if you want to live with it or something. I can understand that, all right? I, I really can. But I think if you look at the known risks, the known disadvantages of breast augmentation surgery and the fact that this would be a decision you're making that changes the rest of your life irrevocably, unlike hair dye, you can choose to dye your hair and later get a new haircut, I think any doctor would probably be commended for taking the time to say that young woman, well, maybe you should think about a non-surgical approach to this. So I make this video at a time when I've had contact with just a few people who were transgender, but who were themselves struggling to find a voice in the transgender movement to define themselves as transgender, but opposed to surgery, to define themselves as transgender but skeptical about hormones or as outright opposed to hormones. And those people may end up having to adopt a new political identity or even a new gender identity. Because what they encounter again and again is the hostility of transgender people who are deeply committed to justifying the surgery and justifying the hormone therapy as a core part of their political identity as well as being part of their gender identity. This is a debate that in the next 20 years in the Western world is yet to unfold.